In the previous video, we discussed how um, essentially we monitor the amount of force that we're producing with the Golgi tendon organ, and then how we understand the length or positioning of skeletal muscle with um, muscle spindles. So now we'll move out of proprioception and into types of muscle contraction. Again, if you don't already, go back and review your notes, understand of how muscles actually contract. I want you to get a great understanding of those actin and myosin filaments creating cross bridges and trying to pull sarcomeres in closer and closer together, right? Because when we visualize this, I want you to be able to picture those subcellular um, components interacting in the different types of muscle contractions. We're going to zoom through this uh, mainly because I think this is a review for the majority of students who have already heard this and is mostly common sense. In general, we have three types of muscle contractions. Those uh, muscle contractions fit in uh, to either an isometric, concentric, or eccentric muscle contraction. So what do, we, what do those mean? Let's break them down individually. An isometric contraction is essentially uh, described as a contraction in which there's no change in the uh, length of the muscle. Right? This means that the force that the muscle produced is exactly the same as the force or resistance that it's trying to work against. This could be in one or two ways. So examples that I give in the, the lab can be just essentially holding a weight with a barbell, barbell um, and being able to hold it and generating, let's say I'm holding a 10 pound barbell, I'm able to hold it here by generating 10 pounds of force. Or the other terribly cheesy example that we give is pushing on a wall. Using good old Newton's law of uh, for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction of I'm not strong enough to push down a wall, and so it's exacting the exact amount of force that I'm pushing against it. Therefore, the length of my skeletal muscles aren't changing. If we picture what's going on, though, at a subcellular level of those actin and myosin, I want you to think about cross bridge cycling is still happening, right? So we're still trying to move sarcomeres closer together. However, we're really unable to do it, and so cross bridge cycling, while it is happening, it is not actually generating any decreases in the length of sarcomere, okay? The next contraction is, of course, a concentric contraction, and this is what we think of mostly as muscle contractions in that we generate um, an amount of force that is greater than the force in which we're opposing. So in my dumbbell example, again, we will start to lift. Let's say it's a 10-pound dumbbell. We're able to generate more than 10 pounds of force, and so we're able to move that, um, that uh, weight. Right. And again, this is exactly how all the videos that we showed in the previous and how you guys explained it in your assignment of how a muscle contracts. Right? Actin and myosin form cross bridges. We pull the actin closer together. Since the actin is tightly bound to the, the sarcomere at the Z-line, that sarcomere then decreases in size. Right, so we're shortening the muscle, shortening the sarcomeres. We put a bunch of sarcomeres in series. That muscle then becomes shorter. When we shorten our muscle, we then are able to uh, produce the known movement. The last type of movement is what's called eccentric muscle contractions. This is a lengthening contraction. Again, in this situation, as opposed to shortening the muscle, while we are generating force, the opposing force that we are working in is more than the force of, that we are generating during the muscle contraction, and therefore the muscle head will ultimately lengthen. Right? If you picture what's going on here, as we talk about in the lab, that this is actin and myosin, is trying to pull the sarcomere closer together, trying to squeeze those Z-lines. However, it's failing because it cannot generate enough force during those cross-bridge cycles in order to actually squeeze the muscle together. However, we'll talk about this in the next slide. This is actually going to actually have a greater impact on muscle force. So let's walk through what is now a very classical exercise physiology graph. This is looking at what's known as the force velocity curve. Another way to think about it is the uh, velocity in which a contraction happens, so how fast you can complete a movement based on the amount of force that you have to generate. Right? Uh, we can kind of think about this as you sit at your computer and want to think about this. You can visually think about how you do this. So if we start in the bottom right of this graph, so if we look at shortening velocity to the far right would be the fastest velocity in which we can create a movement. Of course, that is going to take place at the least amount of force. So if you just think again, going back to our classic Barbara curl, if you think about how fast you can do it, the fastest you can generate that movement will of course be with a force of zero, right? So that's uh, uh, demonstrated by this point here. 
Right? If we then added two pounds, let's say, onto that dumbbell and tried to lift it again, we could still move it pretty fast, but it would be slightly slower. Of course, as we continue to add weight and continue to add weight and continue to add weight, of course, the idea is that the more weight we add, the harder that contraction is to generate, the, the slower we're able to ultimately move that load, uh, and therefore our shortening velocity, as you see, moves closer to zero and gets less and less. Ultimately, right before in this last uh, dot that you'll see, this is essentially what we would consider our one rep max. Again, this is still a concentric contraction. We're able to lift this in a uh, fully uh, activated contraction. We're able to shorten, although the velocity is incredibly slow, just as you might imagine. So it's, you know, you're terrible, you're working as hard as you can, and you can barely move it. Right? If we move to the very next uh, point on the line, they're shown by the black dot. This is where uh, velocity equals zero. This force, otherwise known as max isometric force, is essentially the maximal amount of force that your muscles can generate. Again, this is a isometric contraction such that uh, it's not concentric or shortening or eccentric or lengthening. Indeed, it's that muscle is staying at the exact length uh, in which it is there, no change in length, then of course means that it is a maximal contraction, and therefore we call it a maximal isometric contraction. Of course, as we start to lengthen, what you'll notice, and this may be less intuitive as opposed to the concentric contraction, is that we actually start to see an increase in force. So one thing you may be slightly confused about is you'll see that as we go to the left of this with the blue dots, we actually see velocity going in the negative direction, right? Since this is actually uh, in the opposite direction of the force being applied, we're trying to generate force this way, but our velocity is going this way, that's why we consider this a negative velocity. So what you see is that as you uh, increase the essentially amount of force that you're trying to produce, um, or the greater the resistance that you're working against and unable to, um, um, to generate as much force, the velocity is actually going to increase. Right? So we kind of generate a curve that looks something like that. Right? So if we take the figure that comes from your book in order to be able to kind of look at this as a, as a more seamless curve, this is kind of what it looks like as opposed to single individual points. Right? So a couple things that we can point out. One is that you'll see that the eccentric contraction actually generates a force that is much, much larger than the isometric or contractile force. The question is, why does that happen? Right? It's a really good uh, thought uh, of why that happens is, is twofold. One is because, as we learned in the structure of function of muscle, is muscle isn't just muscle cells only. It's surrounded, of course, by la layers and layers of connective tissue. This connective tissue, the epi, peri, and endomyceum are there in order to kind of wrap and surround muscles. Well, when they do that, these actually add kind of an elasticity component into uh, the eccentric force. So what happens is, as you begin to produce more and more force through an eccentric contraction, or the lengthening velocity begins to increase, what happens is you start to kind of pull on these rubber band type connective tissues that surround the muscle. This force is called passive force, and so now we're adding an active force generation that's happening inside the um, actin and myosin cross bridges as trying to actively develop force. We're adding on now a previously unused passive force. Again, that passive force is like stretching on um, a rubber band. The more you pull on it, right, the harder it is to extend. And that's the exact same thing that's going on in the muscle. So as we start to try to pull on that connective tissue, that connective tissue now adds to the force, and we're then able to generate more force in an eccentric contraction than a concentric contraction. I will note that, of course, this is not without consequence. And something we'll talk about uh, in the next lecture is that, yes, we can generate more force, but the downside is we also generate muscle damage because we actually do start to kind of tear those little bits of rubber band or connective tissue and actually cause small tears in skeletal muscle, which is ultimately going to be somewhat detrimental in the short term, but very beneficial in the long term, as we'll soon learn. So one thing we'll also talk about is looking, using this force velocity curve, not only to 
um, understand what's going on at the molecular levels, but also to bring it back into an applied exercise physiology training, right? So this is what's considered kind of training specificity. The idea that if you want to improve uh, different, uh, uh, improve your performance in different type of events, we can work along different parts of this force velocity curve. Right? So in the bottom we have velocity, so you can write that into your graph here, and then uh, in the y-axis we have uh, force. Right? So now if we go back, we're just working in that right-hand quadrant, concentric contractions uh, in the force velocity curve. Right? If you're trying to gain strength, what you need to be, of course, doing is doing heavy weights. So common uh, application now tells us that strength training, as you can see in this, needs to take place in that low velocity but high force part of the curve, right? So anywhere between 70 to 90 percent of one rep max. Power training, which power means that we're trying to generate as much force as fast as possible, is this kind of component that takes place not only in force production, but doing it in a fast, uh, high velocity movement, right? We can think about this such as football players want to be powerful movements, or we think about this in Olympic lifters who want to move weights really, really fast. Indeed, power training, of course, we also need to train the velocity aspect as well as the strength component. Therefore, as you might expect, power training will take place somewhere in between a combination of those rounds. So you'll mix it up, working higher on the velocity side of things in the 40%, sometimes higher on the strength and kind of working again in that little range of 40 to 60% to not only improve force but also improve velocity. As we look at speed and strength training, uh, trying to improve speed is ultimately going to be working again on that velocity side of things. So in the last two, speed and strength or speed and velocity, we're going to be usually lo working lower than 50%. Uh, again, looking at the high velocity parts in order to improve performance in those aspects. Right? So here's some effects of training on the force velocity curve. So you'll see here uh, that before training in both of the graphs is in the light blue, and after training is in the red. So what we'll see again in that force velocity curve, staying in the right-hand quadrant, concentric contractions only. Right? So you'll look on the left-hand side, and what, what we see is, of course, this is a, tra a classic strength training protocol, whereas they're trying to increase maximal strength. And so you'll see that the red line, or the after training bar, is much, much higher than the uh, before training in maximal isometric force. Right? So this protocol, again, would be probably working in that 75 to 90 percent of, uh, of the force velocity curve. If we look in the right-hand side of this, of course, this is a great example of what a, um, a training program that would be really focused on speed would look at. Right? So there's no change. So they're likely working, again, 30 uh, to 60 percent of their uh, one rep max. So you see there's no real change in force. Our maximal isometric forces are exactly the same, since those aren't changing, uh, because we're not lifting enough weights to actually cause adaptation. Right? Instead, we're working on speed, and so as you can see, uh, the uh, force that we can generate at these really rapid velocities, seen in the lower right-hand corner, is markedly increased, and we show that this is how power training works. So moving from the force velocity curve now into the length tension relationship. The length tension, tension relationship is um, another extremely classic look at exercise physiology and understanding how a muscle works. As we've discussed previously over and over and over again, the idea is we need to be able to visualize actin and myosin cross bridges. Ultimately, we develop force by having and being able to understand the number of cross bridge formations which can be made in order to move the sarcomeres in. Right? So one of the main determinants of how many actin and myosin cross bridges we can have that work together is ultimately the arrangement of those actin and myosin cross bridges right before an exercise starts. Right? So if we can look here, what we'll look at is three different points on the curve here. So in the left-hand corner, we see that this is um, in what would be considered a shortened uh, sarcomere length. Then we'll move to optimal length, and then last but not least, we'll will be in uh, past optimal length in a stretched formation. Right? What I want to do is start with optimal length. Indeed, thankfully our skeletal muscles are regularly positioned so that for the most part we stay in and around optimal length. You'll see that optimal length is actually a pretty decent range. Indeed, that uh, uh, orange part is where 
uh, you can uh, clearly see that this is where our muscles uh, can be in a normal physiological range. If we go outside of that into either green, then we're uh, somehow detaching muscle from bone, and of course, that's not really going to be good for your force development. Um, and so these are more lab type situations, of course. Right, so thankfully, we are somewhat uh, kind of built in a way that our muscles usually hover around optimal length. Right, so what do I mean by optimal length? When I say optimal length, I mean that there's optimal overlap between actin and myosin. Those thick and thin filaments are able to have a maximal number of cross bridge cycles in order to be able to shrink that skeletal muscle. If we think about moving outside of that range, so if we move to the left, where that we become kind of shorter in this situation, what happens is you can kind of visualize here, as shown on the screen, is that that sarcomere isn't really able to contract anymore, right? We're ultimately contracted that sarcomere all the way, so that the thin filaments or actin filaments are all the way close. So ultimately what we've done is we've overlapped, we've completely removed the H zone, which is thick filaments only, and our sarcomeres are already maximally shortened. As you can imagine, this may not take a lot of actin and myosin cross bridge cycles to shorten it that way, therefore the force production is going to be much less, as we can see by a decrease in the, um, in the graph. If we look at the optimal length, moving past that on the lengthening phase, Right? The exact same thing happens, but instead of having uh, um, the sarcomere shortened in such a way, ultimately now we're stretching it and pulling it apart. As we can see in the graph here, this is um, obviously the far end of the spectrum, but you can see that the thick filament is actually no longer able to interact with the thin filaments in, uh, in this graph. Right? So when we think about that, if our actinomycin can't interact, then of course how much force can we produce? Little to none, of course. Right? So ultimately, we need to be able to stay in that optimal length to have actin and myosin be able to interact. Luckily, as we mentioned, our muscles really stay pretty close to this optimal length at all given times. If we think about this from an applied perspective, you know, how does this work? One of the things that we can um, talk about is the idea of doing a bench press. And what is, of course, then the hardest part of doing a bench press? The hardest part is not getting the weights off, not lowering it down, but it's usually at the very bottom of the lift, right when you get ready to move it. And why is that? That's because if you think about it, our chest muscles, our pec muscles are stretched. We're in this long lengthening portion outside of the optimal length. Therefore, we are trying to generate as much force, but we don't have optimal uh, uh, interaction between actin and mice and cross bridges. And that's why usually the lowering part is what's called the sticking point of the lift is ultimately what's going to be the hardest part of trying to move that weight. Once you get it off that chest, then most people are able to complete the lift. So as exercise physiologists, we have come up with ways to kind of get around this. So one of the new techniques that um, is being integrated in uh, most strength and conditioning programs now is using something called a chain. And that chain is essentially as it, as it says, it's just a link of chain that's very heavy that essentially rests on the ground so that uh, the force production isn't near as high in order to work at that bottom. So uh, when the chain rests on the ground, it removes that resistance, so it's more of a, com uh, uh, more of a similar resistance throughout the entire uh, uh, lift. I'll throw up a video of, of some of that uh, using, uh, uh, using chains in the weight room to kind of give you a better idea of what that looks like uh, after, uh, at the bottom of this module. So the last thing that we'll look at is looking at how fast we can produce force and the time it takes in order to generate that. Right? So as we've talked about, we've now looked at the link tension relationship, we've looked at the force velocity curves, and we're now looking into how does this actually come into uh, working with training and exercise physiology. So if we'll look at, um, again, the untrained here is in the red line, the heavy strength training in the green, and the blue is the uh, explosive or power training. Right? What you can see is that if you strength train only, so in that green line, heavy strength training, you actually don't really generate force any faster. Right? So as you can see, the red and green line early on don't really have um, any separation. They overlap exactly to about 200 milliseconds. Right? So that means that, uh, again, you're not generating these uh, movements very fast. Instead, you're just able to generate more force. Right? And you can see that, so as the force continues to increase in the green line and is greater than the red line. 
power training. Again, that idea of if we're trying to train rapid movements, we'll see that power training, we're actually able to generate a lot of force a lot faster. However, you'll see that our maximal force is no longer, uh, is greater than untrained, of course, but is, of course, less than our heavy strength training. So hopefully that gives you a good perspective of how uh, some of these actin and myosin molecules ultimately relate in the development of tension, how that then relates to exercise physiology. In the next lecture, we're going to get into um, more adaptations into what happens with prolonged endurance and strength training in skeletal muscle.